Oh my gosh. I learned so much during this conversation that I had with Kira Sutherland. And I hope that you get as much out of it as I did. Selfishly, I'm just like, oh, I'm asking her these questions and getting uh, so much great info. Uh, knowledgeable, such a knowledgeable person. Uh, she's an Australian naturopath, uh, nutritionist and sports nutritionist. And she's got she said almost 30 years, she's aging herself. She's 53. So she's been doing this a uh, long time. Uh, she actually went to Australia, American, went to Australia uh, to to go to college and she never left. She met somebody and now she's an Australian for sure. Uh, but yeah, we talked about a lot of different things. It's funny because I had found her on Instagram and was interested in her, in her for astrology. Uh, but she has two Instagram accounts. And so we ended up not talking about astrology because I recently had somebody else talk about that. So she's actually knowledgeable in that as well. So she, we talk about, uh, she, she and her husband uh, are really, I would call them endurance athletes because anybody who does an Ironman is an endurance athlete, uh, but they, they really know their stuff. And she, we talked about, uh, supplements. We talked about intermittent fasting. We talked about the mind, spirit, body connection and what the spirit piece means. And that was super interesting. So I loved it. And uh, with no further ado, I'm going to let you start listening. Welcome to another episode of Living Your Sparked Second Half. Today's guest is Kira Sutherland from Australia, although she is in Canada right now skiing. So I'm I'm jealous because one of my dreams, Kira, is to stay in a chalet like yeah. over Christmas. Yeah. My my husband like will not go somewhere cold. So oh, no. I guess, yeah, I guess yeah. I have to go alone with my girlfriends. So welcome yeah. to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And I'm literally in a chalet for Christmas and beyond. I'm sorry. Yeah, you said two months. Yeah, two months. We have yes. a, we decided, my family is super sporty and we decided years ago that instead of having like an investment property that you, we would do retirement in our 40s and 50s and beyond. So we, we purchased a little cabin in the mountains of Canada and we try to spend as much time here as possible. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, because I saw that you like the snow and you and and then I saw somewhere that you were like went to Canada because yeah. I was like, it's summer in Australia. So she <laughs> it confuses yeah. everybody. And then it confuses me with trying to organize time zones and clients. And yeah, it's always a little bit chaotic, but that's all right. Yeah. So I found her on Instagram. Like I find, find a lot of interesting people and she was nice enough to talk to me and, uh, and agree to come on the program. So she is a naturopath. I want you to talk and introduce yourself and like what sure. you do, but I thought the topic was really great and timely too, because a lot of people are thinking about their health at the beginning of the year. Yep. Uh, so I think we'll have a great conversation about that. And I'm trying yeah. to do, I turn 64 in wow. less than a month. Yeah. And looking so, good. Yeah. So on January 14th, which was exactly a month to my birthday, I was like, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to cut out all refined sugar and I'm going to stop drinking alcohol. And so, mm. and I've been doing some things like I started juicing and like, I'm feeling so much better because I think I had a yeast issue for a little while and I, it was so hard to get rid of it, but uh, yeah, so I'm feeling really good and yeah. I want to feel even better on my birthday. Yeah. 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 That's a great idea. Yeah. So um, let me explain. I'm actually an Australian naturopath because it's quite a different, it's a different qualification to a North American naturopath. So if everybody's a bit confused about my accent, I'm actually American born. So I'm born and raised in San Francisco. And then I've spent almost all my adult life in Sydney, Australia, besides coming to Canada every year. It's yeah, very confusing. Um, so Australian naturopathy is actually an undergrad degree, not a postgrad degree. Um, so it's a Bachelor of Science. And then I went and did postgrad studies in sports nutrition. So I'm actually a bit of an anomaly in that I went and did more of a dietetic style postgrad education. So I kind of sit, sit I'm a very nutrition based naturopath. And um, yeah, so I roll with 
I work with, oh my gosh, I work with anybody, but I, I work with mainly athletes or people trying to get really fit or people that are choosing to do sport, especially as a master's athlete, which is, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond. And I work a lot with people, especially endurance sport. But then by default, I do a lot of weight loss. And now that I'm 53, I do a lot of, I work with a lot of women, perimenopause, menopause and beyond. That's great. So you left San Francisco for Australia. That's a big move. That was huge. It was so, huge. I was, yeah. I was an exchange student there when I was 15, 16 and just my soul was in love with it. So I just kept going back and going back. And then I moved when I was 20, almost 24. Mm, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then they allow you to stay there? Once uh, you- I, well, I moved and um, got in on a partner visa. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. So my, my husband's Australian and okay. yeah. So that makes it a little easier. It's yes. absolutely impossible to immigrate to Australia. Yeah. Do you find your accent changes? Like when you're in Australia, it's stronger. And then when you're in Canada or North America, it kind of shifts. I I find that with some people. Yeah. Yes, it does. I think I used to sound more Australian, but we lived in Canada for two full years and I'm in British Columbia. And so West Coast Canadian, West Coast Californian isn't very different. So I reinstigated my, uh, my North American accent a few years ago. Isn't that yeah. funny how that works? Yeah. yeah, you do have a very different accent. Oh, it it does. It's kind of like yeah. a blend. So, yeah. yeah. So, what can you tell us about? Uh, you know, I, I really like to find uh, ways to educate my audience and mm-hmm. and things that you know can improve their health, uh, can help them live longer, uh, help them have a smoother menopause. I know mine was miserable. I had the worst hot flashes. Uh, yeah. So, so what can, you know, obviously uh, you well tell me what naturopath means. Is it diet? Is it exercise? Is it? So, yep. Yeah. So a naturopath, whether we're in North America or in Australia, a naturopath practices nutritional medicine. So I am actually qualified like a degree in nutrition as well. Um, I'm an herbalist or a herbalist, depending on what country you're in, you have to say it differently. Herbalist, nutrition, um, I do practice homeopathy. Some naturopaths don't anymore. And kind of lifestyle, health and lifestyle. So it's really what mm, a lot of people now think of as integrative medicine. A lot of doctors are leaning towards what's called integrative medicine. And that's really what naturopaths have been doing. Now, I am nowhere near, I'm not a doctor of anything, Um, North America has a doctorate in naturopathy, but that's not me, as I said before, but we are basically, we look at people, you know, it's not like just seeing a nutritionist or an herbalist. We are looking at the whole body, physical, mental, emotional. Years ago, naturopathy had a lot more kind of woo woo spirituality within it as well, or energetics. And, and though that's not taught as much anymore, a lot of us still incorporate just what we call the holistic triad, mind, body, spirit, and really working on health on all of those levels, not just the physical level. Yeah. So uh, that made me think of this because I think a lot of people, when they decide to get on a health kick, they only focus on one and that's body. And they're like, I want to get the body fixed. But yeah. there's so much more. And I love how you brought spirit into it because, you know, mm-hmm. it, mindset is so much of it. But tell yeah. me what the difference between like mind and spirit is to you. Oh, uh, we, we, um, originally when I was taught, so I've been practicing, I'm one year short of 30 or three decades of practice. So um, we were taught a lot more kind of energetic medicine, whether that's homeopathy or giving flower essences like Bach flowers, which some people might know, um, looking at people's emotional and mental state and giving different medicines that vibrationally help to support that, but also just looking at someone's holistic life and what what's going on with them, well, mentally, emotionally, and you know, physically. Oh my gosh, how do I explain it? We just... We look at the body as 
an intelligent being of its own, kind of separate from our own mind. And it has the idea, we have this idea in naturopathy that we call vitality or your, your core vital force or vital spirit. If you go back into texts hundreds of years ago, it goes into this a lot. And it's the idea that we have this innate intelligence within our body that works on all of these different levels, trying to keep us healthy. And the body wants to be in this optimum state, but dependent on what goes on in our life, outside influences, things we do to ourselves, things we eat or don't eat, drink or don't drink, think or don't think. Um, that influences this core vital force or vitality and and naturopathy is really looking at working on all of those levels yeah yeah I yeah. love that so I worked with a personality expert and he is able to look at people and tell if they're aligned their soul is aligned Ooh. with who they were born to be or not Ooh, I love that and yeah. yeah and it's so interesting because uh, we actually went to a mall and we're watching people because he was teaching me how to read people. And uh, it, the ones who were, and, and I would describe this in the soul area versus, you yeah. know, the men, well, my, mind, of course, plays in part of it, but that, that higher self that you're disconnected from. And when you're disconnected from that, you can tell by how somebody w walks, like wow. if, if, you yeah. know, depending on their type. Um, but or or they're super overweight the, and it's a real clear that you're misaligned and that oh. you need to get into alignment uh with that deeper form of intelligence that is within you so I love that so yeah. much I mean there's yeah. so much I mean and, and don't get me wrong it's exhausting everyone's like oh my god I'm just trying to work on my physical now you're adding in all of this other stuff but when we're looking at true holistic optimum health, we are looking at health on all of these layers. And, you know, when something goes wrong in one area, be it physical or even like emotional, if somebody, somebody breaks your heart, you know, that's an emotion, but we actually feel it physically in the body. We feel empty in our chest or our stomach starts, you know, feeling tight. Um, you know, there's, or the wind feels like the wind got knocked out of you. And that there's this whole energetics that influences our physical body as well. And then potentially can influence biochemistry and how the body's actually working. So, you know, when one area goes out, be it emotionally, other areas, physical and other things can follow suit and everything kind of gets out of whack. Whereas when we're working on one layer, be it say physical, say you decide to go for a run or a good walk. We, that's great for your physical, it's great for your circulation. We all know the things that that does, but it also changes your endorphin state. It changes your hormones, changes your neurotransmitters. It changes all these things that, that then influence how the body feels and how our mind feels and how we feel about ourselves. And so there's you know, doing something positive in one of these areas will often pull the rest of the other areas into alignment as well. And I don't think we give ourselves credit for how intertwined all of these things can be um, in influencing our health. You know, as people, it's January right now and everyone's like, oh my God, I got to work on my physical health. I got to do this. Absolutely. But there's all these other areas to work on as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that you brought up your kind of mm. vibration. Mm. And I don't think a lot of people know that I learned that very late in life. I wish I knew it a lot earlier. I mean, I, yep. I actually remember the first time my sister said, she, she said she was older, she's a year older. And uh, one day we must've been like 10 or she, she was probably like 12 in middle school. You know, when you're, you're having all that angsty stuff happening. Yeah. And she said one day, I'm in a bad mood. I think I asked her a question. She goes, I'm in a bad mood. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it, there's, there's these moods, these things that are moods. You know, it's, I, I have a vivid recollection of having this like aha that we actually have these moods that affect how we feel. Yeah. And, and, what, we so, eat and yeah. what we do and how we sleep and yeah, everything cascades on each other. So just, can you talk to the listeners about like what what is it vibrational frequency and and how how can that really impact us in terms of like attracting the things well, we want you know that's 
Mm, that's a really interesting question. So I don't necessarily do energetic work on people. I have lots of friends that do things like that. But it's it's the idea that it's just the idea that energetically everything is going to influence. It's like, it, oh my gosh, there's so many, you know, everything we're doing is on all of these different levels. And we just, it's about tuning in and being aware of what's going on or being in tune with your, I mean, if we want to say soul or spirit or whatever, but what, you know, inner listening, you know, everyone talks about mindfulness these days and meditation and mindfulness, but in reality, that's a more modern world word, mindfulness, about tapping into your inner listening and slowing down and listening to your intuition and your gut instinct and what should be going on. And, you know, your body gives you these little signals, you know, whether it's physical symptoms, like you've got a head cold, you've got a stomach ache, you're, bow you're constipated all the time, you know, all these little things that we just kind of go, oh, that's just me. No, those are symptoms that your body is kind of, your body's intelligence is going, hey, have a look here, something's not right let's make an adjustment. But a lot of times we ignore these things or again, we just kind of go, oh, that's just who I am. And it's like, or I inherited that, you know, because yeah. my, my mom was always constipated. So when I had struggles with it, I was like, I never thought about it. It was, hey, she, we eat the same stuff because she taught me how to eat. You know? yeah. I never figured that out. I was just like, oh yeah, it's the hereditary yeah. thing. Constipation yeah. is definitely not inherited unless you have <laughs> some like long, you know, ex, ex, you know, enormously long bowel, which every now and then somebody does. But no, you learned your habits of constipation from the people you grew up with. And, you know, as they say, where you are most influenced health-wise by your five closest people, not just your friends, but like partners, children, and um goes a long way. Who you hang out with goes a long way as to how you actually deal with your own health. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, in terms of, you were telling me that you do triathlons or Ironmans, uh, yeah. and that's how you met your, your husband. Yeah. It, yeah. That's to me, a big mental thing. Like, you know, I mean, it takes a lot to get through one of those. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. Do you yeah. visualize? Cause I love visualization and I know a lot of like high performing athletes do that with a lot of success. Yeah. Do, do you, help, does that help you? Yeah. So when I was first doing them, so my husband and I met 22 years ago doing triathlon and yes, I absolutely, as I was first starting in triathlon, I just do it for fun. I'm an age grouper. Um, Iron and Man so for is, fun. <laughs> so is he. Yeah. There's thousands of us around the world. Tens of oh. thousands of us. It's crazy. Oh. Um, so yes, absolutely. I was taught to visualize the whole race and each step of the race and what it was going to feel like. I can't say I do that as much anymore, probably because I'm not as scared of the whole situation as I was because I've done quite a few now. Um, I have to admit, I haven't raced in quite a few years due to COVID and all kinds of other stuff, having kids. Um, but yeah, visualization of having a great race. Absolutely. Because like, for those people who don't know, Ironman takes all day. This is, this is swimming. Oh, I only really know it in kilometers, but 3.8 kilometers, which is like over two, two miles. It's biking a hundred miles or, or 182 kilometers or something like that. And then you run a full marathon. So 26 miles or 42.2 mm -hmm. kilometers. Yeah. So, you know, the fastest people in the world do it in seven to eight and a half hours. The average person takes 12 hours to do it, which is about what I do. 11 and a half, 12 hours. Um, my husband is super fast and does it in nine and a half. Um, but you have 17 hours to finish this race. And it's, look, by the time you've got to the race, you know physically you're capable because you've put in the training. But it's really a mental, emotional thing about what it's going to take you to keep going. And I'll be honest, the first time I did one, I almost would say I did it for the spiritual journey of where did I have to dig? What did I have to, where did I have to take myself to be able to finish this journey? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, because yeah. I think, you know, I'm, I've am i done 5Ks. The longest I've done yeah, yeah. was a four-mile race. Yeah, um, still but, a race. And I, you know, sometimes I've, I think I'd want to do a marathon, but then, mm-hmm. or, uh, and then I, then I think, oh, a half why marathon. Not? And then I'm like, well, why, you know, do I really want that? <laughs> so I have like this inner like conversation going on, but I think it would be hard to like get past. I'm competitive and mm-hmm. to like, to be, be like having people pass you would be like, Ur. I don't Yeah. Yeah. You just got to, I, I think the biggest thing, especially as an age group athlete or people choosing to run marathons, or whatever, like we're in our fifties, right? This is, this is, we're not going out for the Olympics. This is not, I'm not breaking any world records. I'm only running my own race. And right. I, yeah. I have to say, I am competitive with myself. I'm not actually competitive with other people. And you also have to realize everyone there is running their own race. And the minute you start not running your own race and you start running at the same speed as somebody else, that's their race, not your race. And it's, it sounds cliche, but it's a great analogy for how to live your life as well. Like you have to stay within your own known boundaries of this is what I've trained. This is how fast I should be going. If I go faster than that, I'm going to blow myself up and then I won't be able to finish or I'm going to get dehydrated or I'm going to run out of, I'm a sports nutrition as well. So I know about my fueling, but the minute you focus on somebody else, it destroys your pacing, but it destroys your inner peace in some ways. I mean, if you were at the top of an age group, absolutely. You, my husband will race people, but in, you know, people passing you, Sometimes you pass them back later and it's, it's a real tortoise in the hair having to go, no, if that's their pace, that's their pace. This is my pace, right? I love that. I have to say, I have to say, I'm going to be a little bit sexist here for a minute. When I started doing triathlon, only 10% of the population was female doing triathlon. And in long distance triathlon, all the girls, we used to joke that you, as a female, you have to pass every male bike rider twice because on a bike, you, um, you know, if you come up to somebody, you're not allowed to sit right behind them because that's considered cheating in a long distance race. You have to go around them and then settle back into your own pace. And every time you go around a guy, their ego would be like, oh my God, a female just passed me. (laughs) And they would pass you, even though they were going slower than you, they would speed up and pass you. And then invariably they would slow down again and you would have to go by them again. And we used to always joke about as a female, you pass everybody twice. That's so funny. I guess that's a form of drafting if you're right behind them, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. You're not allowed to do that. yeah. 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 So uh, that is so powerful though. I love that, that you're, you have to run your own race and, yeah. and you don't, and you, you really steal your inner peace. That is so powerful. Thank you for that. Yeah. I've never actually thought about it that way for, I mean, I've, I've thought about it. And when I talk to clients about not going too fast because they're going to mess up their nutrition strategy then, but, but it's like, it's like Instagram, it's like social media. It's everything we're seeing out there and comparing ourselves to is just astronomically intense at the moment and really hard. And in reality, we are all so different, different body types, different shapes, different metabolisms, different systems that are weak or strong. And I think we're in this chaos at the moment of information overload, but it isn't the right information for us. Mm, Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about actual, uh, cause I saw on your Instagram feed that you were mm-hmm. recommending certain products for certain things. So if you had to like recommend something for somebody who's over 50 going through menopause, like what would be your like highest recommend, you know, like most recommended, like What's do my this. Go-to? Yeah. My yeah. go-to supplement. I don't want to name any brands, but also North America's different brands, but my go-to supplement I think for every human being, but especially women at perimenopause, menopause and beyond would be magnesium. Now, Mm. caveat, 
If you are on medications, if you have any health stuff, please talk to a health professional. They, magnesium can interact. If you have are on blood pressure medication and stuff like that, there can be interactions. So I'm not prescribing medication, I mean, magnesium to any of your listeners, but investigate it yourself. Um, magnesium is just unbelievable for energy, for blood sugar levels for at menopause, you know, it's for stress. It's, oh my God, it, it can help placate um, hot flashes. Magnesium plus taurine is my go-to for stabilizing hot flashes. Um, do you take it in pill form or do you no, do it like a drink never, of it? Never, okay. never, never. I hate, that sounds terrible. I don't hate magnesium tablets. Um, if you have to take it as a tablet, please take it as a capsule, not a tablet. Every time you take something as a compounded tablet, there's fillers and byproducts to bind it all together. I'd mm. prefer, and they can be hard to digest. And as we age every decade, we lose digestive power. So I'm a much bigger fan of capsules, but I'm really a big fan of powders. And I know it's not mm. fun. Mix it up. I don't even like the taste of my magnesium powder, but I mix it with vitamin C powder that tastes really yummy. And then I do two things at once. So That's I'm a, a great huge idea. fan of magnesium powders or just a tiny little bit of like pineapple juice or, you know, whatever, right. whatever works, but I will always move people from tablets to powders. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a I big vitamin C that. person because my yeah. mother used to always say, take your vitamin C and it yeah, used to yeah. drive me crazy. But then as I became a mother and I realized I would like start getting a sore throat and I just like yeah. take a vitamin C and it would be gone. Yeah. So I know that's a, yeah. a big one Ma as well. Yeah. Magnesium with some taurine is probably my big go-to for menopausal women. Oh my God. What about so vitamin D? Cause I know vitamin yeah. D I, I was, I was low on it at, at an appointment. So I, yeah. I do that as well. Vitamin, I think it's vitamin D3 cause it has some K in it or something. Yeah. D3 and K is the big thing, especially for bone density and yes. anyone in their forties, yeah. even if you're not to perimenopause yet or menopause, get your bone density checked, find out where it's at. So you have a baseline to know, because as soon as you start losing progesterone and estrogen, you, and once we're not ovulating, ovulation is this whole beautiful orchestra that also helps the body with bone density. And as we lose our estrogen and progesterone and our ovulation, our bone density, you know, it's not still growing by any means, but that's where we lose it so quickly um, is after menopause. So yes, um, people don't tend to prescribe calcium as often anymore. There's questions about whether we should be prescribing calcium. I will leave that to doctors, um, but yeah, D3 and K, but again, find out what your D levels are. You don't want to take D if you don't need it. Um, some countries will test for D really easily. Other countries are getting a bit funny where the doctors are like, oh, I've been told not to run. Uh, depending on health systems, doctors are trying not to run a lot of tests because they get in trouble. So you can always, you know, at a doctor, if they're saying, oh, I don't really want to run that, just say to them, you'll pay for it yourself. A vitamin D test is so cheap, but it's amazing to know where you are. And, and if I can say to your listeners as well, always ask for a copy of all your blood tests, because if you ask for it right as you're sitting there, often, it depends again what country, all they have to do is tick a box and they'll get two sets of the tests. One gets sent to you and one stays with them. And it's great to keep your tests so that you can look back and know. And I think that's one of the big things about being in control of your health even if you don't really understand how to read a blood test, having those in sequence over the years to know what you've been doing. And sometimes, you know, doctors or, or naturopaths will do this as well. We'll scan a blood test really quickly because we have a lot of other things to cover. And we'll be like, oh yeah, everything's in range because we're just looking for highlighted or starred things or things in red that are out of range. But in reality, you could be sitting at the last two digits before you're deficient, but you're still gonna to get told that you're okay. But that's the average for everybody. And um, it's, 
we're not everybody and we're not all the same. And as a naturopath, we have levels of D that we want you higher into than a lot of um, regular doctors, only by a few points. But um, I don't want to be sitting at 50 or 60 points at, at the scale that we use in Australia. 50 is considered, 49 is deficient, 50 is okay. I want to be in like 80 where mm -hmm. 90 is considered more optimum and, and yeah, you need to know. Yeah, it's funny you should say that because my, so now my system is, they do all the tests and you can log into, it's called my chart yeah. and it's really yeah. nice. And so the last time I had a physical, I had the physical from the year before. And I was like, well, let yeah. me look at like what I was before. Mm -hmm. And you're so right. I wouldn't have saved that if I didn't have yeah. it in that system. And even I love digital and I love being paperless. I would download all of that. I download, print out. I have this huge folder. I still have a filing cabinet in my house. I don't know who does, but I do. And I have this folder and I can just go back and quickly look just to have it for yourself, just in case the system goes down or, yeah. you know, in Australia recently, one of our big medical systems got um, hacked. hacked. Wow. Mm. Yeah. And mm. you could change doctors and who's going to go in there and download, download, download. It's kind of like, you do. I, I do have Every a filing time. cabinet, but I have like this many like stack of papers that yeah, to be filed. So oh, that, yeah. I have a filing box of to be filed, but I have to do that every quarter. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, this yeah. has been very interesting. So yeah, I've, I've, like I said, I I've been on this recent health kick. And so I find the juicing juicing I'm really liking because uh, I used to kind of turn my nose up at juicing. Cause I was like, eh, you know, and I didn't understand it. And like people, I see people do celery juice, but now that I really understand, like I, I make this concoction and it's yeah. and carrots and celery are actually super like anti-cancer and really good yeah. for you. And then I put ginger and turmeric in it. And it's like, it's really amazing. tasty. Yeah. Beets yeah. and I can't eat a beet. So, but I can juice a beet. <laughs> That's the thing, yeah. you know, juicing isn't for everybody. And if someone is like pre-diabetic or diabetic, they have to really watch blood sugar levels. But if we're talking, we're not talking apple and orange juice. We're talking right. mainly vegetable juice. Sometimes we add in a little bit of, I love adding in um, green apple into juices. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but green apple is not 80% of the juice, people. <laughs> yeah. I know we would like it to be. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's an amazing way to get this nutrient huge hit yes. where often people are too busy or they don't like enough vegetables to get mm -hmm. that in. And um, and it's great. And it's, you know, in traditional naturop naturopathy, ju the idea of juicing is it's passive absorption. You know, the fiber has gone a lot. Your body will very easily absorb all of that and it doesn't tax the system and so it's this idea of, um, oh, it gives the system a rest. It's like when people do. You're fasting. right. Yeah. Because you're, people it has fasting. to break down the food. Yeah. 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 And so the and, juice, it doesn't. And yeah. so it's, it's a bit of a rest kind yeah. of an idea. Yeah. 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 That's so true. Yeah. The guy that I've been following who I've been learning a lot from, he does water fasts for like three days. No, <laughs> I'm not like, so I'm going to be honest. I'm not a fan. Okay. I, I get that people do it. I've read all the research on it. I've read all the traditional books. If people want to water fast, that's totally up to them. But again, they have to be very careful. That is very intense to do to the body. They need to, you know, if you're on medications that you shouldn't be stopping, don't. Um, I get it. And again, that's a complete stop of everything and letting the body do what's known as autophagy or autophagy, depending on where you are in the world, how you want to say it. And it's the idea, and it's, this is an old naturopathic principle. It's the idea that if you stop eating or if you're doing like a juice fasting um, or like broth and things like that, you are, when you're not giving your body enough calories, the body will turn around with um, autophagy and it will go and eat up your old dead and dying cells anyway, because it doesn't really want to eat your newer, more vibrant cells. And it's like a, it literally, you're cleansing yourself or just helping with the turnover of the old junk in some ways. That's not very technical the way I said that, but anyway. Um, but I'm more a fan of a green juice 
bone broth or if someone's plant-based, you get them to bake up what's known as a potassium broth where you boil up a bunch of veggies, strain off all the veggies and you just drink the fluid because you're getting a lot of the minerals there. I like the idea of a little bit of green juice because those antioxidants and minerals coming in are also going to help grab onto, you know, when you're doing a detoxification, you know, when you're doing a cleanse or detox or not saying I prescribe these, but the idea is as your body is going around cleansing itself, it's also if you're breaking down adipose or fat tissue, that's where we store a lot of chemicals and toxins in our bodies and our fat tissues. And as your body is living off of its own fat, these chemicals and toxins are released into your bloodstream and in your lymphatics. And so if you're only doing water, it's just harder on the system because these chemicals are coming through and yes, you're giving it water, but if you're giving it some form of nutrients, some of those nutrients can be chelators, especially coming from green foods and grab onto some mm. of those substances and help the body excrete or eliminate them more gently. It's like spirulina is something that I'll often mm -hmm. add in or chlorella because that is, it's, in, it's known as incredible chelator. Yeah. Uh, I have so, a green, you know, yep, a little powder. tub that I put in to my yep. shake in the morning and I think it's got those things in it. It did. I, I told my husband this morning when I smell it, it smells like I just went out and picked my grass out of my yard. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. they don't taste great, but yeah. Yeah. So I'm not against water fasting, but I think it should be supervised. And I, I get a little bit nervous about, you know, everybody learning stuff on the internet, but not knowing the ins and outs. And I know people are out there giving great mm -hmm. information, but yeah. 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 I don't, I don't know that I could do a other. I mean, I like to eat, so uh, it's, it's hard for me to do just an, an eating cleanse, That's yeah. all, you know, like yeah. all vegetables for three days or whatever, but yeah. um, yeah. So before we uh, end, I would love to, cause we talked about intermittent fasting and I would love to get your perspective on that. Cause that's a big fad right now. And yeah. a lot of people yeah. might be doing that. I tell you, I went on a trip to Greece with, um, a group of women and this one person, I, she, first of all, she was way too thin, I think. Mm. And, uh, she would only eat one meal a day and yeah. it was dinner and she would, I, I don't even know how she could do workouts or, or like how she could survive, but she, she would go all day until and she was working out in the morning. Yeah. 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 She, I, and we had yoga that. in the morning and then we had, um, sometimes a hit workout like later in the day. And then, yeah, that's actually from a sports science perspective, that's actually crippling a lot of your systems that are trying to replenish your glycogen stores, which is your stored carbohydrate for exercise. There is some research that if you don't eat within, the research is actually within two hours, but a lot of people will try to get you, like in sports nutrition, I want people, this is sports nutrition, but this is for every human being. If you come to see me as a practitioner, if you want to do intermittent fasting or not, that's great. But the minute you exercise, you should be then feeding your body within the next 30 minutes to one hour because you've potentized your cells to respond to insulin. So your body will actually cope with the food you eat after exercise better than any other time of day. Um, you've you've stimulated something called glycogen synthase while you've exercised glycogen synthase's whole job is to take the carbohydrates you eat and turn them into stored glycogen not body fat stored glycogen so that like the safest time metabolically for us to be eating our starches or our you know our root vegetables our grains if we're going to eat bread or grains if you're going to eat carbs starchy carbs after exercise is by far the safest time to eat them because they're going to get turned straight into um, glycogen. They're not going to go down quite a hard pathway actually to change carbs to body fat. So that's the number one thing I do with people and especially in weight loss. If people come in and they're exercising, but they're waiting too long from exercise to eating, I will change that up and get them to fuel right away. And then their body kind of goes, oh, you've moved. And then you fueled me. I feel safe now. 
I don't need to keep holding on to everything because I never know when you're going to feed me. You know, whether people choose to do intermittent fasting or not, and there's like 10 different ways to do IF. But the truth is one of the healthiest things we can do for our body is to follow circadian rhythms, to go to bed at night at the same time, as often as you can. You know, yes, we go out now and then, but go to bed within the same hour every night, wake up at the same time every day and actually eat your meals, whether it's three meals, two meals, not a fan of one meal, but um, eat at the same time every day because your body wants that regularity and it will then feel safe. And I also want to point out, sorry, I go off on tangents when I hear things like this, just eating at night is a metabolic, it's not metabolically efficient. Just like we have a sleep-wake cycle, our digestive system also has its own circadian rhythm. Every organ in your body has its own rhythm. And our digestive system is actually strongest from the time we wake up until about 2 p.m. Our insulin is more potent. Our body is more responsive to insulin. And then once we hit kind of two or three o'clock, those things actually drift off. You know, they drift down. And so actually at night, we are, our digestive system doesn't function as strong. Our insulin, our cells aren't as responsive to insulin. So to me, eating your one meal at night is the worst thing possible. I would, if that person still wants to do just one meal a day, absolutely between 10 and two. Um, but I'm a huge fan of fueling at morning at lunch and then lighter dinner. Yeah. I mean, I just couldn't imagine because I get hangry, you know, I, oh. I get, I get, get tired. I get like even faint if I don't get some yeah. sustenance in me. So I couldn't imagine, but yeah, yeah. Well, and well. it's so useful because, you know, I'm thinking about, I worked out this morning and I usually have a shake and oh. I think I had it pretty soon after, I think it was within okay. an hour, but I was like, okay. did I, did I just have coffee and wait till later? <laughs> what did yeah, I do? Yeah. Within the hour. Absolutely. Yeah. And you will have so much more energy for the rest of the day as well, because if we don't fuel properly after exercise, I'm going to sound very unscientific here, but your brain kind of gets pissed off because your brain loves to operate off glucose, right? Yes. Your brain can operate off ketones, but that takes a long time. And uh, you know, a day or so to transition. And that's not, we're not talking about ketogenic here, but your brain is like, oh, where's my fuel? And so if it doesn't get fueled within that hour after exercise, it will then turn up your hunger for carbs and sugars. Cause the body knows sugar is the fastest thing from mouth through digestive system to get back up to the brain mm -hmm. via the bloodstream. And so if we don't fuel properly after exercise, we're tired for the rest of the day. Your body's trying to play catch up and making more glycogen stores and the brain gets kind of pissed off. And also with people that get hangry, there's different body types, right? This is the thing. There's all this health information out there. But in reality, we are not all one body type, right? We are, you know, biochemically we have different sexes or we have, you know, we operate differently hormonally, which is going to influence our hunger as well. But some of us carry more uh, muscle. Some of us are almost five foot 10, six foot. Some, we're talking about women here. Some are, you know, six foot, some are five foot two. And, you know, some people put on muscle really easy, but never gain body fat. Other people do truly gain body fat really easy. And, we're, we're prescribing all this nutrition to people that's not, not individualized or at least it's not yeah. looking at this, you know, and Ayurvedic medicine looks at, it's more than three body types. They call it the doshas. And they talk about how we're each made up of energetically these three doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha, but we're all made up of different ratios of these. And you know, a more dominant kapha dosha is going to put on weight really easily, whether it be body fat or muscle, whereas a vata body, a person that's more dominant in vata is going to be really skinny, whether they're short or really tall. They're like that string being, they're the perfect yoga instructor body, you know, and, but they need to eat really frequently. Whereas the bigger body type actually can fast a lot longer because they have all these stores and we don't take that, you know, intermittent fasting can be great, 
but you have to look at it for your body type. And really, we're a lot more than three body types. We probably break down into about six different body types. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. interesting. So, so fascinating. Thank you so much for being here yeah. and educating us. Yeah. I, I think oh, this is like, so, like you're so knowledgeable in so many different areas and you explained it all so well. So I was, I was pretty mesmerized. Oh. So it's well, helped me. me. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. I think it's just figuring out what works for each person. Right. And mm-hmm. yes, it's confusing and, but go try different things for, yes. for yourself and, and, each decade, especially as you hit 40s, 50s, 60s, what worked for you in your 40s might not work for you in your 50s. Change it up. We have to change up your, we know you have to change up exercise every now and then your body gets used to what you're doing. It's the same with what we eat. It's the same with, you know. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. You said sleep, you know, in terms of rhythms and you know, be consistent. Uh, so that's something I need to work on. But uh, what what is so true too is you're not supposed. And tell me if if you agree. Okay. But you're not supposed to eat the same things every day, day in day out. Your bo- your body needs like well, to be, yeah. be exposed to different things. Supposedly, it wants variety because variety yeah. means bigger nutritional spectrum. Yes. So yes, most of us eat the same breakfast, or we have two breakfasts. Mm-hmm. But just yeah changing it up can be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Because we, as we get older, we, there's certain foods that, you know, can cause inflammation and stuff. And if you mix it up, then that's less likely to. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so interesting. Body into how we feel with certain foods, you know, one of my favorite things in the new year, and this is not about redoing all of your health and changing everything, but have a listen to your body. Keep a, my, one of my favorite things to do with people, as long as they don't have an eating disorder, is I get them to keep a food, mood, and energy diary for a week or two. Yeah. And just notice how you feel yeah. after certain foods or why did you eat that food or, you know, and I'm not saying I'm not going to not eat chocolate, but note how I feel after it or, you know, what, what, certain dinners that probably have inflammatory foods. I didn't feel good the next day. You know, it's not just instantly how you feel with food. It's 24, 48 hours later. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. A food mood journal or notebook. I love that. That's great. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank awesome. you so much. It was such it a, was fabulous a great to meet you. chatting with you and uh, enjoy the rest of your time there in Canada. I will. I will. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you so much for tuning into the Not Your Average Lives podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe on iTunes if you have an Apple device. You can find free resources and learn what else I have going on at the moment that might interest you on my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you liked this episode, it would make my heart so happy if you could leave me a five-star rating. You can also add a review to let me know what you like about this podcast, which will help spread the word about it to others who need a little midlife inspiration. As always, be you, listen to your inner voice, and focus on reigniting that lost spark so you can start living your own, not your average life. Mm-hmm.